Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project. This is Wednesday, April 28th, 2021, and welcome to the 58th session of MAVEN Project's COVID-19 update, led by Dr. Debbie Gold, a retired infectious disease doctor and hospital epidemiologist from Kaiser San Francisco. Dr. Gold is joined by MAVEN's physician volunteer panelists, Dr. Hunter Hansfield, infectious disease, Dr. Ramona Doyle, pulmonary and critical care, Dr. Lois Friedman, psychiatry, Dr. Judy and Smith, psychiatry, and Dr. Libby Sauter, obstetrics and gynecology. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced phys volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and customized education sessions. Thanks to our generous donors who make all our work, including this session, possible. A big shout out to our MAVEN Project physician volunteers. Last week was Volunteer Appreciation Week, and we are so appreciative of all the work and hours and passion that you put into providing medical consults, medical education, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring for uh, the primary care providers who work in safety net clinics who are our partners. So um, as always, feel free to share these COVID session recordings with colleagues and friends and invite them to attend the live sessions as well. So first I'd like to go ahead and um, have Dr. Sauter um, be able to share some thoughts about what's happening in the OBGYN world with COVID-19. So um, I'm just gonna present um, in terms of vaccination in pregnant women. And th these are the preliminary findings from a study on, on the messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccine and the safety in, uh, in pregnant persons. And it was from the New England Journal of Medicine actually a week ago. And the study was done to characterize the initial safety of the messenger RNA in pregnant women. It was December 14th when the vaccination first came out to February 28th. And it was data from three different sources from the vSafe after vaccine health check surveillance system, which um, is an uh, Android iPhone app that you have on your phone. The second was the vSafe pregnancy rate reg registry. And the third was the uh, vaccine Versus event registry, which we're all aware of from the just regular vaccinations. Um, so this is the characteristics of the data that of the uh, people that were included. It was a you know a pretty big population. Um, the major age ranges, obviously, since they were pregnant, um, were in the 25 to 34 range. Um, it was not very diverse. It, it was 50-50 with both vaccines, but the majority of the respondents were non-Hispanic whites. Um, again, since they were doing it from the onset of pregnancy, that it was low in the um, uh, first trimester of pregnancy, uh, very early pregnancy, 2.6%, but then it was about 25% each in uh, first trimester and third trimester with the major re representation done in the uh, second trimester of pregnancy. Uh, they also looked at if any of the um, people had ever had COVID-19 and it was uh, pretty, you know, uh, low amounts only in the, you know, 1%. So the study was of 35,000 uh, women ages 16 to believe it or not, 54, who identified themselves as pregnant. Um, again, as I said, it was equal distribution between Pfizer and Moderna and the majority were non-Hispanic white. And at the time of vaccination, 86% uh, of the patients reported that they were pregnant. Um, other people came on later, either finding out they were pregnant or, you know, cause you can find out up to the first six to eight weeks, you don't really know um, for sure sometimes. Um, and they looked at, um, as every, all the other studies, local and systemic reactions after each dose. And it was reported um, more frequently to have more uh, reactions after the second dose. Um, these patterns were similar to, um, the um, pattern seen both in the um, uh, pregnant and the non-pregnant patients. However, they did see more injection site pain uh, in the uh, pregnant women. So this is a um, comparison of the pregnant and non-pregnant uh, patients going through reporting, self-reporting their uh, symptoms. The pregnant are in the dark blue, the non-pregnant are in the light blue. And you can see the pain at the injection site was more in, in uh, both of the uh, vaccinations. And actually in the, after the second dose, uh, fatigue was reported a little bit more after the uh, 
in the vaccinated patients versus uh, in the uh, pregnant patients versus the non-pregnant patients. Um, the non-pregnant patients, uh, interestingly, had more symptoms um, than the non-pregnant patients otherwise. Um, so then from the V-SAFE registry, they, um, the, the initial registry on the, uh, on the apps, they have this V-SAFE pregnancy uh, registry where they call the people that identify themselves, believe it or not, first as uh, non-male, and then under the age of uh, 54 that uh, are reporting that pregnant. So they made fi about 5,000 phone calls, about 4,000 were actually enrolled in the, um, in the program and 95% uh, reported uh, were reported as healthcare workers. But that's also because this study was done at the initial stages when those were the people that were getting the vaccinations. Um, again, they most of them were between the ages of 25 to 44. Most again were 79% um, non-Hispanic white. And the data is being collected now and is ongoing through uh, the patient, the uh, people, the um, the people in the study that were in first and second trimester. Um, this, this registry collects a much more extensive history on the patient, uh, any pregnancy complications. It even collects data on their doctors and their hospitals, and then they follow up on the newborn. So it's a relatively extensive registry. Um, there were 827 in the registry that completed their pregnancy. And 86% of them, it was live births, 12.6% were spontaneous abortions and 0.1% uh, were uh, stillbirths. The main thing out of this uh, registry that they wanted everybody to know is that among the participants that completed the pregnancy reporting congenital anomalies, which is one of our major concerns, none had received the COVID-19 vaccine in the first trimester or in the period uh, conceptual period, and there were no specific patterns of the congenital anomalies that were observed. And if you look, this is a, a table of, this is the incidence of these complications of pregnancy compared to what they were in the uh, V-SAFE registry of those getting the vaccination. So you can see in the ranges, in fact, for example, spontaneous abortion, it's you know 12 percent, and that's at the lower end of the published incidence. And preterm birth, again, is at the lower end. Um, it's interesting because spontaneous abortion uh, in the first trimester is now even, um, the used to be up to 12% and now is even increasing to 15 or, or higher because of some a lot more unreported cases. Um, the VAERS system we're all familiar with, 221 were identified through actually the VAERS system uh, of which 70, uh, percent of the uh, adverse reactions were non-pregnancy related um, specific reactions. Tw about 30% did involve pregnancy or neonatal uh, reactions. And if you look at you know the amount of people in the study that had the around 12% that had spontaneous abortion, that's who these, these people are, the 46 who had the spontaneous abortion, uh, 37 of them were in the first trimester and two were in the second trimester and then they didn't know in the others. Then the other complications that they reported were stillbirth, uh, premature rupture of membranes and vaginal bleeding, three in each one of those categories, which again is about what you expect in the general population. And they saw no congenital abnormalities reported uh, to the VARA system, which actually had been a requirement of the EUA for it. So the conclusion is that um, vaccination for protection against COVID-19 in pregnancy is important, especially when the women are at higher risk for complications and adverse outcomes due to the COVID-19 infection in pregnancy. The other is that there's, uh, as I reported a couple of weeks ago, um, vaccination uh, provides uh, some transfer of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibodies to um, the newborn. And then there's um, early data from the V-SAFE and the V-SAFE uh, pregnancy registry and the VAERS um, uh, reporting system that don't indicate any obvious uh, safety signals with respect to the pregnancy or neonatal outcomes associated with the COVID-19 vaccination in, in the third trimester. Again, I, it, this is mostly in the third trimester. So the limitations of the study are that it was self-reporting through um, your phone app. And the study was um, done in the early, um, 
the majority of the pregnant people were still are still with ongoing pregnancy in the because they were um, vaccinated when they were in first and second trimester. And uh, all the neonatal outcomes that we know of are just in uh, third trimester vaccination. Um, I'm not going to do the next slide, but the um, interesting thing is that right now, if you look at when people became pregnant or knew they were pregnant or got the vaccination in the early first trimester, all of those right now are at the stage where they're having their evaluation for neural tube defects and also going through their anatomy scans. And some of them, in fact, are beyond their anatomy scans or a month or so beyond. So I think we're going to be collecting a lot more data on that, you know, those trimesters. Unfortunately, studies can't make pregnancy go faster. So we just have to deal with, you know, the, the timing of things. Okay, so now I have to end it. Do I new share? No. Pause share. How's that? Stop there, share. There yeah. we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Sauter. Thank you, Libby. Great. Um, okay, now slideshow from the beginning. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna um, jump right in here. Uh, I have a long agenda. Hopefully I will get through it. Um, I have to pause here on the worldwide cases. We are almost at 150 million cases worldwide and an increase in 11 million cases since two weeks ago when I last presented. A lot of this, um, a lot of these cases are being driven by the um, stunning uh, events in India uh, where they are seeing a million cases every two and a half to three days now and huge numbers of deaths as well. Um, in the United States, we're closing in on 33 million cases and um, getting close now to 600,000 deaths. Uh, the data from the New York Times, which is now being presented in a slightly different way, shows that our seven day rolling average is about 55,000 cases a day um, as of a couple of days ago. And the, as you can see here on the curve, it's actually starting to come down um, at least over the last week. So that is some promising data. Although the uh, overall um, cases in the United States are going down, there are still some hotspots and these are the highest counties um, in the United States. Um, and you should pay attention to the number of cases per 100,000 population here. So the highest is uh, a a county in Virginia. There are three counties in Texas um, that um, are on the list here and um, a couple in um, Michigan. And then the highest one is in Ferry County, Washington, which has had a 4,400% increase. Uh, the numbers are pretty small, but um, increasing rapidly in the um, Pacific Northwest. Uh, there are also some areas in Oregon that are um, having uh, outbreaks as well. Hospitalizations, uh, seven day rolling average, about uh, 44.5 thousand pa patients hospitalized per day. Um, and this is also slowly starting to go down. Hopefully that will be continue to be a trend. Um, and deaths are staying pretty much flat, 706 deaths a day as of a couple of days ago. Um, and this has been flat to falling over the last few weeks. So also some good news there. Um, the big news uh, yesterday was the CDC issued a revision of its guidance for what fully vaccinated people can do, and I'm going to show you only the highlights of this. The document it itself is fairly long, and I could actually spend the entire hour going over the very granular detail um, that is laid out by the CDC about what people can do and not do, but basically people who are fully vaccinated do not need to wear a mask outdoors, except in certain crowded settings in venues like stadiums and um, outdoor theaters and, and places like that. Uh, it's no longer necessary to be restricted from work following an exposure as long as individuals remain asymptomatic. Um, it's no longer needed to quarantine following a known exposure if uh, the person is a resident in a non-healthcare congregate setting, which means a prison or a homeless shelter, uh, uh, settings like that. Um, 
fully vaccinated people are exempted from routine screening tests if they are not exposed and asymptomatic. Um, but there is a provision that fully vaccinated immunocompromised people need to consult their healthcare provider about these uh, restrictions. And I'm going to present a, um, a paper, a preprint that it suggests that individuals who are in, on immunocompromising medications uh, really cannot follow these guidelines. There was a handy graphic that um, appeared in the revised guidelines. I'll give you the reference for it, but basically um, it's what unvaccinated people can do and what fully vaccinated people can do. And the, and the main thrust here is being outdoors without um, being, being able to go outdoors without a mask, even if you're unvaccinated. Um, and then these are the indoor activities for which um, masking is still recommended for everyone. There are three over-the-counter COVID-19 tests that are currently available. Um, they are available in stores and online with people who are asymptomatic or symptomatic in uh, CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart. The first is the Alum antigen test that's available just in four states now, but the rest of the states are be, are, will, should be carrying it uh, by the end of May. It's $39 for a single test um, and results are available in 15 minutes. The Abbott Binax Now antigen self-test is available in a two-pack for $24. Turnaround time is 15 minutes. And uh, first I thought, oh, that is a real bargain because you could do two tests for 24 bucks and why would you buy the Illum test if you could do this? Um, but as it turns out to compensate for the decreased sensitivity of an antigen test, you actually do the test twice, at least 36 hours apart over three days. And that's why they give you two tests. And then finally, there's the LabCorp PCR self-test, which you collect at home using a nasal swab. It's $120. You mail it by, uh, by FedEx overnight back to LabCorp, and the results occur, uh, will be turned around in one to two days. Um, please note that these tests are not covered by insurance. Some um, uh, mention of um, therapeutics. The, um, FDA on April 16th revoked its emergency use authorization for bamlanivimab. Um, there was, there has been sustained increase of a viral variants that are resistant to this single monoclonal antibody, um, increasing risk for treatment failure. And so the FDA felt that the benefit no longer outweighed the risk. And so that um, EUA was revoked. Um, Lily has made an announcement about Bartonisit, Barcitinib, oh my God, I'm just still having such difficulties with that. Um, they uh, issued a press release on April 8th, uh, which, um, in which they released um, phase three study data on a study that was done, a global study actually, um, that had patients from the United States, South America, Central America, Russia, India, and uh, some countries in Asia and in the EU. There were 1,525 hospitalized patients who were either not requiring oxygen or were requiring supplemental oxygen or high flow oxygen or non-invasive ventilation, but not, ven not on mechanical ventilation, who were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to barcitinib plus the standard of care versus placebo in the standard of care. It should be noted that uh, in the standard of care during the time of this uh, study in, um, what included steroids. And so almost 80% of the patients were on steroids and almost 20% were on remdesivir, some were on both. Um, and they used a composite primary endpoint, which was the difference in proportion of patients progressing to a first occurrence of non-invasive ventilation including high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation or ECMO or death by day 28. And the result was that they did not meet statistical significance for, composite, for the composite primary endpoint. However, 38% decrease in death from any cause by day 28 in the barcitinib group was noted. Um, and that was statistically significant, although 
a decrease in death was not a primary endpoint. And the conclusion was that the addition of barcitinib to steroids for patients who had severe disease may reduce mortality, but it's unclear which patients would benefit most from this intervention. The NIH also made an announcement on a barcitinib uh, trial on April 14th. This was a different trial, the ACTT4, which actually closed after only 1,000 patients of the planned 1,500 patients were enrolled in the study. The, the study asked, is barcitinib plus remdesivir superior to dexamethasone plus remdesivir with respect to the risk of progression of patients on supplemental oxygen to mechanical ventilation or death. The Data Safety Monitoring Board found that the study met predefined futility criteria after only 1,000 patients were enrolled. And the, so they found that neither regimen was likely significantly better than the other. No safety issues were identified with either treatment. And so the conclusion was that barcitinib and remdesivir is reasonable when steroids cannot be used. But steroids, I think, still remain the standard of care. Um, just a word about worldwide vaccination process. I've said very little of the, about this over the last weeks or so, um, but about a billion doses of vaccine have been administered worldwide, but that administration has not been uh, smooth around the world. 83% of doses have been administered to individuals living in high and upper middle income countries, and only 0.2% of doses have been administered in low income countries. North America, the rate of vaccination is 45 doses per 100 population. South America, 16 per 100 population but in Africa, just over one per 100 population. So we have a long way to go um, in a lot of the world, especially in the developing world. Um, this is a graphic showing the uh, share of people who have received at least one dose of COVID vaccine. And you, you can see up here, um, this is the curve for Israel, which is far out above um, most other countries, the UAE and United Kingdom are very pretty close behind. And here's the United States, here are Germany and France. But you can see here this vertical line, which is the kingdom of Bhutan that started vaccinating its population on March 27th because the uh, priests in that country determined that that was a very uh, propitious day to begin vaccination. And within a two week period, they vaccinated 93% of the adults in that country. So um, where there is a will, there is a way. About 8% of people in the United States are not uh, getting their second dose of mRNA vaccine. And this is very, um, very worrisome because the second dose is needed to confer durability of the vaccine response. Um, and so while we are sort of struggling to get to uh, um, herd immunity, which is the, the bar for which is getting higher and higher because of the um, variants that are now circulating that show increased transmissibility, now this is an added problem um, in these individuals who are not returning for their second dose. So why not? One, it would be a fear of side effects. I think probably the J&J &J pause, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, may be contributing to this. But there's also a misunderstanding that one dose is really enough and why bother going back for the second. Um, there are some pharmacies that have canceled second doses due to insufficiency of supply. And then when those individuals try to scramble to find a pharmacy that has the same brand of vaccine, they can't find one and then they finally give up. So um, if you are not uh, yourself administering vaccine in your clinic, you may wanna be asking your patients about this and whether they returned for their second dose if they were getting it. Um, at, a, at a nearby pharmacy to be sure that they have indeed gotten their second dose. If they're late, it doesn't matter. They should get that second dose whenever they possibly can. Um, there have been some cases of um, herpes zoster reported after Pfizer vaccination. I've been reading about these um, case reports in emerging infections network 
uh, for the last couple of months, actually, the, I would say the last three months, people have been writing in saying, has anybody else been seeing Zoster after Pfizer vaccination? Well, this is a study that was published that's been accepted for publication in rheumatology from Israel. It's an observational study that was basically asking what are the adverse effects that occur in patients with autoimmune inflammatory rheumatoid disease following Pfizer vaccination. So they were looking at patients who had autoimmune disease um, and controls in two large rheumatology clinics. And they identified six cases of zoster, which was 1.2% of the, of the population with autoimmune disease and no cases in controls. There were no cases of disseminated zoster or, and no cases of post-herpetic neuralgia. Not all of these patients had received um, zoster vaccination because of age. I was gonna tell you about all six of the cases, but I'll only tell you about three of them in, in the interest of time, just so you can get a flavor of what these cases are like. Um, the first was a 44 year old woman with Sjogren's who was on hydroxychloroquine for Sjogren's, not for COVID-19, um, who developed L5 zoster three days after the first dose um, of a vaccine. It was not mentioned whether she went back for the second. Case two was a 56 year old woman with rheumatoid arth arthritis on a um, tofacitinib who, who developed uh, herpes ophthalmicus four days after the first dose. She declined the second dose of vaccine. Um, and the third was a 59 year old woman with rheumatoid arthritis on epidactinib, epidactinib and prednisone, five milligrams a day, who developed Zoster two days after the second dose. She had had Zostavax in 2019. So this is something that you may see um, in, uh, in, you know, comp in uh, patients with autoimmune disease, although the cases that I recall reading in Emerging Infections Network, I, I don't believe had autoimmune disease. Oh, let's just skip over these. Um, so there is a possible new adverse effect that's being looked into uh, by the health ministry in Israel. Um, they are looking at tens of incidents of myocarditis occurring among more than 5 million vaccinated people. These are occurring primarily after the second dose in men under the age of 30. They have not established a causal link to vaccine, but they're looking into this and I'm more to come on this issue. So um, I wanna talk a bit about the uh, evolving clot story of following Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So uh, we know that there was a pause placed on April 13th um, and uh, based on six cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in uh, pretty young women. Um, the ACIP met on April 23rd and voted to resume use of J&J &J with a new warning about uh, the risk of clot and, uh, without age or gender restrictions. And I wanna talk about um, what they discussed at this meeting by showing you some slides from directly from their meeting. They are referring to this co um, condition as TTS or thrombocytopenic thrombotic syndrome. Um, and this is just showing you a distribution of um, cases in women, most of which occurred in women between the ages of 30 and 39 years old. There were actually 15 cases reported here. And one of the ideas behind the, um, the pause was not only to I alert physicians and, and clinicians about this phenomenon and teach them how to treat it and identify it, but also to see if there were any more cases out there. And in fact, they quickly went from six to 15 cases. And this morning I read that two additional cases have been identified, one in a woman and one in a man, uh, both of them under the age of 50. So you can just see, see here the age distribution, 30 to 39 seems to be the peak. Um, and these slides are actually taken directly from the slides that were shown at the ACIP meeting. Um, these are characteristics of the patients of the 15, the median age 37, time to symptom onset, uh, median time was eight days with a range of six to 15 days. All of the cases that they looked at occurred in women. This did not include the 25 year old man who uh, developed this syndrome in the phase three study. 
um, there were 12 cases of ce cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or CVST. And risk factors for thrombosis, um, there were only two women who were on oral contraceptives, but seven of them were obese. Um, so that was almost half. Um, and then just a sort of the usual other um, risk factors were not present and none of them were pregnant. Um, the signs and symptoms that they presented with early on headache, which started at least six days after vaccination, fevers and chills, nausea, vomiting, malaise, abdominal pain, and then later on in the clinical course as things started to get um, more pronounced or their symptoms became more pronounced, headache was very severe, they had neck pain or stiffness, nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain were persistent, but then the neurological symptoms started to happen, unilateral weakness, speech difficulty, gaze deviation, loss of consciousness and seizure. Um, the many different sinuses in the CNS were involved in um, these uh, th thromboses. And then there were other locations that also, um, that also clotted. And the little crosses here indicate um, patients who, um, was it with or without? I wrote this down. Um, oh, the patients who did not have central venous uh, uh, thrombosis had these ones with the cross. So portal vein thrombosis, superior mesenteric artery, splenic artery, pulmonary artery. These are not only venous clots, these are arterial clots as well. And they're all over the place. Uh, you know, lower extremity veins, iliac arteries, it's almost everything that you can, carotid, everything you can think of, both venous and arterial clots. The treatment um, uh, initially, six of these patients got heparin, which you're not supposed to do because it makes things worse. Twelve of them uh, got uh, non-heparin anticoagulants. Seven of them got, got platelet transfusions, and you're also not supposed to transfuse platelets into these patients. And eight of them got IVIG. Um, outcomes are poor. Three of them, uh, three of the 15 have died. Seven of them remain hospitalized, four in ICU. Um, and only five have been discharged home. I don't know the outcome of, of the uh, additional two cases that were reported this morning. And I think, I just wanna say one thing, and one thing that we, important thing that we don't know about this is, is there a spectrum? Are there people who start to drop their platelets but then haven't made a clot or maybe making small clots that don't present clinically? And so this may be um, a sort of broader phenomenon than we understand right now. And I think a very close monitoring has to be done. Um, so the initial workup in somebody that you suspect might have this syndrome would be CBC with platelets, imaging for the thrombosis in, an, in the uh, whatever area um, seems most likely based on their symptoms using either CT or MRI venogram. D-dimers, um, are usually elevated in these patients. Fibrinogen can be low, which sort of makes it look like um, DIC with a low fibrinogen and low platelets. Um, and then there are the, um, the, the, the um, PF4 ELISA looking for antibody to PF4. All of the cases reported who had this test done were positive. And then if you have a positive, there's a confirmatory PF4 platelet activation assay that has to be done. Um, and there are some that are good and some that are bad. And I can, um, th I believe this reference tells you which ones uh, you should use and which not. Um, this is a reference from the American Society of Hematology that's been continually updated, last updated yesterday. Um, so this will be on the reference list as well. This is an important preprint that was posted in the last week. Um, I'm presenting it because I think it's very um, believable data, it comes from a, a Wash U St. Louis and UCSF. So I think uh, from reliable institutions and um, it's answering a, a, a pressing question, which is how immunogenic are mRNA vaccines in immunosuppressed patients? This is a prospective study that included 133 patients who had chronic inflammatory diseases and 53 immunocompetent controls. They collected blood before vaccination and then one to two weeks after the second dose and they assessed the immune response by measuring anti-spike antibody titers, 
and neutralizing antibody titers. They also looked at plasma cell responses, but I'm not going to show you those data. About a third of the patients had inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, uh, over a quarter had rheumatoid arthritis and over 10% had lupus. And these patients were on a number of different anti-metabolites, anti-TNF inhibitors, um, prednisone. And I um, should point out here that the mean number of milligrams per day was just six and a half. Um, so these were patients who are in pretty low dose steroids. Um, and then a smattering of other things, uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, B cell depleting therapies, which like rituximab, which I want to will um, will point out um, in a minute. Um, so these are antibody titers in uh, the control patients. You can see their um, pre -ant uh, antibody titers um, bumped up quite a bit after um, vaccination. Some of them obviously had had um, pre existing antibodies, but everybody had a big bump. And in fact, if you look at the um, patients with chronic inflammatory disease, almost all the patients did make antibody, but some of them did not make very much antibody. And if you look at their titers, you can see that the controls had significantly higher titers than the patients with chronic inflammatory disease, and this is about a tenfold drop. And the same um, kind of drop can be seen with neutralization titers. Um, so these are significant um, differences between controls and patients who are taking immunosuppressive drugs. These um, data, uh, these graphics show um, differences between patients who were controls, patients who were not taking prednisone, who, but who were taking other immunosuppressing drugs, and then patients who were taking prednisone. And this is looking at antibody titers to spike. And you can see here that there is a little bit of drop off for patients who are taking other immunosuppressives, but a very big drop off for patients who are taking prednisone with or without other immunosuppressives. So this seems to be a very big um, uh, effect and you can see it's re reiterated here in neutralization titers with a, um, a significant decrease compared to controls and even to patients on other immunosuppressives but not steroids. Um, this is looking at individuals who are taking TNF inhibitors, JAK inhibitors, B cell depleting therapies like rituximab, um, anti integrin, and anti IL 1223. And you can see here that, um, these are the control antibody titers to spike, anti TNF, JAK inhibitors, and look down here B cell depleting therapy like rituximab really a big significant drop off in those patients and then back up again for the other two immunosuppressive um, drugs. So this is a, this is a worrisome um, trend here. And this, the, the trend is reiterated here in their neutralization antibodies. Again, a, a progressive decrease, but boy, when you get to rituximab, those titers are really very low compared to the rest of the group. And this just shows the, the categories of drugs that showed significant uh, decrease in, uh, in uh, titer. Um, so it's the, not only the B cell depleting therapies, but also prednisone, JAK inhibitors, and anti-metabolites like methotrexate. The anti-malarials and TNF inhibitors did not show significant drop off. So the conclusions were that most patients with chronic uh, immuno uh, auto, chronic immunotherapy um, were able to mount responses to mRNA vaccines, but the JAK inhibitors, TNF inhibitors, methotrexate steroids, and particularly the B cell depleting therapies have varying deleterious impact on the magnitude and quality of anti-spike IgG and neutralizing responses compared with controls. Limitations were the sample sizes for some classes of immunosuppressives were low, um, and in fact, there were only 10 patients who were on rituximab, but they did have consistent uh, responses to vaccine. There was limited ethnic and racial diversity. Most of these patients were white, um, and um, they did not examine T cell responses in this study, but they are re examining T cell responses, so more to come on this. And I think that this um, preprint is going to get picked up soon to be uh, published. 
I want to talk about breakthrough infections again. The CDC is posting um, weekly breakthrough data. Um, they're doing it in a different way now. So you can see here almost two thirds of the of the 7,000 breakthrough infections reported to the CDC are women. Almost half of them are over 60 years old. About a third of them are asymptomatic. Very few of them uh, require hospitalization and only one um, resulted in a death. But there are several things to understand about these breakthrough numbers. And the first is that these numbers are most certainly an undercount. The system is passive and relies on providers and individuals reporting their um, breakthrough infections. And most people are not going to do that, especially in the real world, when most breakthrough cases will be um, mild or asymptomatic. And because it's not as easy as it used to be to get testing. The CDC and state health departments will, going forward, only investigate breakthrough infections that result in hospitalization or death. Um, in, and uh, to illustrate the problem with breakthrough infections, I want to present this study that was published in the MMWR from the CDC investigation of a Kentucky nursing home outbreak. This was a nursing home that actually held vaccine clinics on January 10th and 21st, and then again on February 21st, offering Pfizer to its 83 residents and 116 healthcare workers. The uptake of vaccine in the residents was excellent. 90% of them were vaccinated, and only but only just over half of the healthcare workers were vaccinated. An outbreak was identified during routine antigen testing, which I believe, as I recall, was done twice a week on healthcare workers. On March 1st, an, a, a symptomatic unvaccinated healthcare worker showed up for work. I just don't get this, but so it was. This person shows up for work, has a positive test, and subsequently 46 additional cases were identified in this nursing facility, 26 of, of them in residents of whom 18 had already been fully vaccinated and 20 in healthcare workers of whom four were fully vaccinated. Whole genome sequencing of these isolates showed that they were of an R1 lineage that contained an E484K mutation or the EEC mutation that I've talked about before in the spike re um, receptor binding domain. This um, mutation confers evasion of the immune system and um, this uh, particular isolate was ne not previously identified in Kentucky. This is an epi curve of the cases. This was the this uh, brilliant index case who presented um, unvaccinated and symptomatic on day zero. And then the crosshatched cases are um, uh, residents of the nursing home who had been previously vaccinated, so lots of them. Um, 26 of them eventually uh, were identified in the first two weeks. Um, there were a few unvaccinated residents who also developed disease. And then the vaccinated healthcare workers, uh, these are, um, were there, I believe there were four of them. And then the rest were unvaccinated healthcare workers of wh whom there were a lot, even presenting at, at almost a month after this uh, brilliant individual showed up at work. So um, this is a table that shows the effectiveness of the vaccine in different populations. Looking at the residents, the vaccine was still effective even in this elderly sort of debilitated population. The effectiveness was 66% against infection. It was 87% effective against symptomatic infection and 94% effective against hospitalization and death. There were two uh, hospitalizations in the vaccinated group and four in the unvaccinated group, one death in a resident in the vaccinated group and two deaths in residents who were unvaccinated. And in the healthcare um, personnel, there were no hospitalizations or death. The um, va vaccination effectiveness was 76% against infection and 87% against symptomatic infection. So if you take the vaccine, it actually does work if you are a healthcare worker. So the conclusions were that the vaccinated residents and healthcare personnel were 87% less likely to have symptoms of COVID-19 compared with those who were unvaccinated. And vaccination of SNF residents and healthcare workers is crucial to reduce the risk 
for SARS-CoV-2 introduction, transmission, and severe outcomes in nursing homes. Limitations were that the health status of residents who declined vaccination might have been different, might have differed from those who consented to vaccination. Maybe they were on hospice or who knows. And then they were using um, antigen testing to do screening, which might have missed some asymptomatic cases just because of the lower sensitivity. Um, I want to talk a minute about airborne transmission. There was um, a World Health Organization funded review that was posted as a preprint last month that said that made the assertion the lack of recoverable viral culture viral culture from samples of SARS-CoV-2 prevents firm conclusions to be drawn about airborne transmission. I think I made a typo in there. What they're saying is because um, it has been, it is not usual that culturable virus can be uh, recovered from air samples. It's difficult to draw conclusions about airborne transmission. Well, there was a very detailed and strong refutation of this conclusion that was published in the Lancet by Chip Schooley's group at um, University of California, San Diego. Um, and they set out their 10 reasons that they strongly endorse airborne transmission as a major mode of transmission for this virus. And I was gonna go through all 10 of, of their arguments, but I won't, I'll just give you the reference and you can look at it yourself. This was a really interesting um, podcast that was, is, it's called um, the Sunday Read, which is the New York Times daily podcast, but on Sundays they, um, will post a longer podcast. And this one was called Voices Carry, which was a very detailed and personal account of the Skagit Valley Chorus super spreader event that occurred in March of 2020. And um, this was a an aerosol super spreader event that was covered in the MMWR back in March of uh, 2020. And, uh, but this was just a really, to me, a very captivating description, which also included interviews with participants in that choir, the director of the choir, what was known at the time. And I just thought it was a very compelling podcast to listen to. Um, there was another church choir super spreader event that was reported from New South Wales, Australia. And this will be published in Emerging Infectious Diseases in the June issue. Um, it involved an 18 year old chorister who had symptoms of COVID-19 onset July 16th of last year. He was uh, PCR positive on July 18th. He sang from the choir loft in four one hour services on July 15th when he was highly infectious, 16th when he had symptoms, and then two concerts on the 17th before he got his PCR uh, report back. All the attendees at the four services were considered close contacts for the purposes of contact tracing. And then public health staff telephoned these attendees. Um, they had uh, sign-in records so they could identify them easily. They released alerts through the church um, newsletter and through media, and then established an on-site testing center at the church. Um, there were 508 contacts who were identified, 85% of whom were tested, most of them within a week after exposure. There were 12 secondary cases of whom um, three were hospitalized and one required ICU care from this outbreak. There were no masks that were required in the church. There was a three meter um, border around the singers who were in a balcony. A microphone was used by this 18 year old chorister so he didn't have to strain his voice a lot. Um, the windows in the church were closed, the HVAC system and the wall fans were turned off and whole genome sequencing confirmed that all of the isolates were identical. This is a graphic of the layout of the church. The chorister was here on the July 15th. Uh, these are where the people were sitting in the July 15th um, um, service and the green are where the uh, infected people were um, sitting in the July 16th service. There were no individuals who attended the July 17th services who were infected. So the conclusion was that transmission was best explained by airborne spread. 
Um, the singing generates more airborne particles than talking. The ventilation was poor and the index was near his peak infectiousness. He had a cycle threshold of 14.5, so a lot of virus present. And by the way, I, I think I forgot to say that they, these guys are up in a balcony. The chorus is up in a balcony and they are like 15, up to 15 meters away from these uh, individuals out here who were um, infected. I wanna talk a bit about um, va variants. I think I'm gonna skip this and just talk about what's been going on here. Um, these are updated data through April 10th. So the CDC is about two days behind, uh, two weeks behind on reporting um, variant data because the work that has to be done to identify these, I, these variants. But you can see here in the peach colored bars, B117 has absolutely been skyrocketing here. We're starting out here the end of January and now we are in the middle of April and there are very few of the, what we would call considered wild type strains, these blue bars and almost everything is B117 that is being, um, that's being transmitted around the hotspots. B1429, which is the California variant is staying pretty stable, um, but B1526, which is the New York variant is increasing increasing and B1525, also a New York variant, also slowly increasing over time. I don't think I was a, a, aware that P1 and B1, B1351 are resistant to the combination Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody. I, and so I thought I would put this up here so you're aware of that as well. Um, we have both of these circulating in the United States to some extent, um, and they are resistant to the combination monoclonal antibody um, by Eli Lilly. There is a new variant that has been identified, the B1617, also known as a double mutant, that emerged in India in December of 2020. This is really a misnomer. Um, it's just referring to two mutations in the receptor binding domain, E484Q, which is similar to the EEC mutation that confers um, immune escape and the L452R mutation, which is the same one that's present in the California, uh, the Cal20C mutant, also known as um, B1427-429, that increases um, transmissibility. Um, so the World Health Organization considers the B1617 a variant of interest. It is spreading quickly in India. Um, but uh, so are B117 and P1. So it's unclear how much it's contributing to the um, exponential growth of cases there. Um, and it, there is some thought that reinfections may be driving the surge in India if um, uh, having prior infection with a wild type strain uh, in 2020 does not provide full protection against uh, infection by both uh, 617, B117, and P1. Um, and I want to end here with CDC guidance for kids' summer camps, which will be open this summer. The um, guidance is based on the knowledge that the risk of infection indoors is much greater than the risk outdoors. They're re recommending that staff and campers should be fully vaccinated two weeks before camp begins. Unvaccinated individuals are um, um, should be self-quarantining for two weeks before arriving at camp and then have a negative test within three days of arrival. Masks should be worn at all times by all staff and campers except while swimming, napping, eating, and drinking. A six foot distance while swimming, napping, eating and drink, drinking should be maintained. But in same group settings, three feet a distance is um, adequate at other times. They uh, recommend avoiding close contact, any sports indoors and large gatherings and any singing and chanting should be done outdoors. And with that, I will stop sharing my slide and will entertain questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Gold. Kind of hard to imagine being at summer camp with <laughs> some of those recommendations, but I know that the <laughs> camps, all the camps are definitely trying. Wonderful, so let's um, get to, we have a lot of questions today. Um, I have friends who live in Canada. They got their first AstraZeneca shots on March 21st, but can't get their second shots for four months. They're coming to the US in May and wanna to try to get the single J&J &J shot while they are here. Should they do that or just wait the four months for the second AstraZeneca shots in Canada? Thanks. 
So um, AstraZeneca is made on an, um, an adenovirus, um, uses an adenovirus vector, and J&J &J uses an adenovirus vector. And AstraZeneca has also been associated with this um, TTS syndrome. So, um, and we don't have data about um, mixing of, of shots. So I think that it, you know, maybe would be wise to wait. It seems odd that they would have a four month wait in Canada for um, getting a second vaccination and maybe um, the United States is going to be releasing AstraZeneca vaccine to the developing world. Maybe they're going to give some to Canada and maybe the wait won't really be that long. I think I would wait for a second AstraZeneca um, or maybe go somewhere where they could get an AstraZeneca second shot rather than taking a and j, &J. Thank you. Just because we don't have data, so. Is there a tendency, at least in the U.S., for a four-month cycle of spikes in cases and hospitalizations? I don't. I don't know if it's on a, a formal four-month cycle. I know I hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if it's cyclical that way. Um, but hopefully, we'll be. You know, being it, we are able to affect the next potential wave by accelerating the vaccine um, progress. And so we might see a delay in the next wave or a smaller next wave or maybe no next wave. So, but I, I can't comment on the on the period of CD, but I haven't really looked. I, I don't I don't know. Thank you. What about public transportation? How does one take public transportation and be safe? Um, masking is still required on all public transport. So that's not only buses, trains, subways, et cetera, but also airplanes. Um, and those, um, those uh, recommendations have not changed. Um, social distancing, if at all possible, should be um, practiced on public transportation. Um, and those are the current recommendations. So there should be, um, they shouldn't be packed um, a lot of people are still not using public transportation. So um, I think it's not an issue many places right now. How sensitive is the Illum test? I think I talked about the Illum test many months ago. I don't remember the sensitivity. I could look it up and rep I could maybe, um, I could look it up and I'll send the information to Jill and Jill, you can send it to whoever asked the question. Okay, great, thank you. Those things don't stay in my, they don't stick in my mind, sorry. <laughs> no worries, you have a lot that does. <laughs> Is there any reason why a breastfeeding woman should not get a COVID vaccine? And Dr. Sauter is um, typing an answer, so we'll wait on that. Um, there are some people who get um, second doses elsewhere, for example, three members of my family, and this can affect statistics. Dr. Hurwitz was just commenting when you were at that point in your talk. Um, oh, is that about um, not, uh, not get, oh, so if you get it some, oh, I see. So people, they think they didn't return for the second dose, but they actually got it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that makes me feel a little better, but I think that there still are people who are not coming back for the second dose. What is the degree of immunity after the first dose of RMDA vaccine? How many days? Of uh, what, which vaccine of, of what? Uh, let's see. So it says RMDA. So I don't know if that was, but um, it's probably. Maybe it's the mRNA vaccine. Yeah, so, I think so. Uh, yep. what's mm -hmm. the degree of mm -hmm. protection? Mm -hmm. So, the, in um, phase three, the protection was, I think, um, fifty-two percent after the first dose. I think the real-world data from Israel showed that the protection was actually better than that in the eighty percent range. Um, but the durability of that protection is going to be shorter because there's no second dose. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't go and get the second dose, even though the protection may be um, 80%, because you need that second dose to um, ensure that there's gonna be durability of the effect. So the real world looked better than the phase three um, data after the first dose. 
What do you recommend for patients on rituximab without antibody and antibody response to the vaccine? Do you think recent re reports on using monoclonal antibodies in these individuals have achieved enough viability and data to support their use? I have not seen any published data um, on monoclonal antibodies in people who are on rituximab. I think practically speaking, those people should be assumed to be not immune and have to take all mitigation measures to avoid infection um, because they may be at increased risk from severe outcomes. And so the same with their family members, all everybody around them should be vaccinated to reduce the risk that they're gonna transmit. Um, but those people should be very careful, especially in communities where there's still a high amount of community transmission. And they should be very careful not to become um, infected and not assume that they are uh, immune, even if they're fully vaccinated. Thank you. Do wild coronavirus infections cause thrombosis? Um, people who have COVID-19 um, get thromboses and those um, thromboses are more frequent than the TTS that occurs after the J&J &J vaccine, but it's not the same phenomenon. Those are patients who get regular old DVTs and PEs and can even get a um, CNS clot, um, but they don't have thrombocytopenia and the mechanism of the, uh, uh, of the process is different. Um, hey, Ramona, do you wanna comment on this? Hi, sorry, uh, I'm here. <laughs> oh, do you wanna comment on this? <laughs> I'm sorry. One, let me just—I hear the question again. I'm sorry. I oh missed. no! I just thought you popped on because you wanted to say something. No, anyway, no, no. Uh, so anyway, so patients who the definitely clotting is a complication of um, COVID-19, but it's not the same. It's not the same mechanism. It's not the same phenomenon at all. The phenomenon after J and J is much more like HIT, like that we would see in the ICU setting, and it also has some overlap with. Um, DIC in the way it, it can present. And there was a very elegant um, explanation of how this process happens after J and J that was done in uh, by Andy Levitt, at, who's the head of hematology at UCSF and in UCSF Grand Rounds on Thursday. I'll include the link for that YouTube. It was just the most elegant explanation of the post J&J &J clotting phenomenon with great cartoons. And I, if you're interested in trying to understand how it happens and how it's different from regular clotting, it's a really nice explanation. And he was two years behind me at the University of Michigan when we were residents. So. Thank you. Do you recall the range of doses for prednisone in the neutralizing antibody study with patients on immunosuppressives? The mean dose was six and a half milligrams per day, plus or minus 5.8 milligrams. So these are people who are in pretty low doses of prednisone, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. Given the information on the immunosuppressive meds effect, would you recommend a booster at three to six months or no point? Is there any point to hold any of the meds for say two weeks prior to vaccinating patients on these meds? So as far as the rituximab, um, patients who had uh, not had rituximab for six months did better. Um, they had better responses, but it's often not realistic to be holding a drug like rituximab. The others, I you know, I'd say maybe you could hold it for two weeks if you if you can um, before and after getting a shot. But there's no formal recommendation for that. And um, I think that there are going to be studies in these patients. There are going to be studies in in CLL patients and other pa and patients with other hematologic malignancies. I'm sure to see if if a third booster will help them, but I can't make any recommendation right now because we don't have any, there are no data, but there will be data um, because this is a population of patients that I, that investigators are very interested in. Thank you.
Um, this is a comment. I share the judgment about healthcare workers showing up for work unvaccinated and symptomatic. However, I'm not surprised. Having cared for nursing home patients, I found the workers to often be less educated, perhaps less qualified, but most importantly, people who have compelling needs to work and earn money to live on and support a poor household. Bless them for their willingness to do this work. Clearly our society needs to support them better to prevent transmission of disease. I agree with that. Thank you for that comment. I, yeah, I mean, I, showing up for work sick is a very complicated, it's a very complicated problem and people are not, and even where I worked, even in a hospital, um, there were, you know, if you, if you were sick, you better show up for work. And if you're sick, you better not show up for work. That's how, that was the message that, um, that healthcare workers got. If you're, work, if you're sick, you better be here, even if you're sick. And if you're sick, you better not be here. If you're sick, we're gonna, if you don't show up, we're going to write you up. Like, mm -hmm. what, what is that? Yeah. At camp, if vaccinated, um, if vaccinated, does the same mask requirements apply? Yes. The masking is for indoor and outdoor um, activities for kids camps. And those, um, those recommendations were posted April, I think 20, 25th, 26th, something like that. So almost at the same time as the, um, the no masking for fully vaccinated. These are kids camps. And so it's not anticipated that kids are gonna be um, fully vaccinated by the time camp occurs. So they're going to be quarantining and testing. Um, yeah. So if a camp for could get all of their kids vaccinated before allowing them on the campus, could they then be unmasked? They wouldn't have to do the masking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But realistically, that's not going to happen because mm -hmm. the while we're, we should be seeing the 12 to 15 year old data from Pfizer and Moderna pretty soon. We're not going to be seeing the um, six month to 11 year old date, data um, until probably early 2022. Mm -hmm. So um, it's possible we might see some sort of preteen, early teen data soon, but whether they're going to get expansion of their emergency use authorization for that age group before camp starts, I don't know. Does the AstraZeneca vaccine prevent the double mutant infection found in India? I mean, does it have activity against the double mutant, the 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 six one seven? I don't know. I have not seen data for AstraZeneca. I think they're using they're using Covid Shield in India. They are using uh, they 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 have their own vaccines there. So I'm not sure that they're using AstraZeneca there. And I I haven't seen I haven't seen data yet for six one seven. Thank you. How good is the Illum test? Oh, um, so I saw Linda McAllister just um, okay. put something into the oh, chat thanks. about the sensitivity of it. 96, over 96% sensitivity. Okay, great. And that might just be uh, coming to the panelists, not to the whole group. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Illum has the, yeah, is the, has the 96% um, PPA and 100% NPA with PCR and symptomatic patients missed only one positive. Uh, the caveat is that 64 patients were studied. So thank you so much, Dr. McAllister, for that. Great. Thanks. And PPA mm -hmm. is it's the percentage agreement with the mm -hmm. with the with the PCR test. That's what they're they're expressing it as, not a sensitivity, but the percentage of tests that agreed with the PCR, which is considered the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a comment um, from a provider in North Carolina. We are seeing people from Mexico and South America who are partially vaccinated with Sinovac and AstraZeneca and have asked for recommendations from the state. Currently, we offer J&J &J at least four weeks after their Sinovac or AstraZeneca since they cannot get either here in the U.S. Ah, that's very interesting. Very interesting. And I, I think that makes sense, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Let's see, is there any reason why a breastfeeding woman should not get a COVID vaccine? Oh, sorry, that Dr. Sauter was- I think no, on. breastfeeding women can get it. Did Libby mm -hmm. say otherwise? Um, um, I'll, have to, I'll have to check on that again. Yeah, I think they no, can. Breastfeeding women can get it. And um, the only thing that it gives them, uh, it gives them their immunity in the vaccination for the baby. They, they've shown some IgA in the breast milk, 
but that's going through maybe the nasopharyngeal passage, a little bit of, you know, immunity, but it's being digested, you know, and IgA, we don't, you know, know it's effectiveness against the COVID, mm -hmm. but there's no contraindication to getting vaccination, no. Thank you. What about the article that referred to six feet versus 60 feet? Uh, the, that's the MIT study. Mm -hmm. So um, I will do that article next week. Okay. Um, I know about that paper. And in fact, there was an article today, either in the New York Times or the Washington Post about it. I, I have it and I, I will review it and, and I'll include it next week. Great. Um, and then Dr. Bernhard, um, one of our rheumatology volunteers comments, the probable mechanism of the HIT-like syndrome post AstraZeneca in J&J &J is well reviewed in the medical ground, grand rounds at UCSF from last week. Right. That's Andy Levitt's mm -hmm. explanation. It's really good. Okay. It's really good. And, you know, he didn't get very much time mm -hmm. and he did a great job in, even in the short time that Bob gave him. Mm -hmm. So. Great. And then this um, may be more for Dr. Sauter. Would you suggest a pregnant woman in her first trimester wait until the second trimester for her vaccine or get it as soon as possible? I would wait because the complications in early, if she got COVID in the first trimester, it's not nearly like the risk factors that you get if you get COVID in third trimester when you might have hypertension already or gestational diabetes or now you're more obese and now you have less lung capacity. I mean, just the pregnancy, the things that come along with pregnancy bring so many risk factors at the end. And we also don't know how long the antibodies are gonna last. So if you're gonna get it first trimester, you're gonna have to get a booster anyway, third trimester. I mean, pregnancy is 40 weeks long. In addition, all the studies have shown only the antibodies that have developed within the maternal system in third trimester and their transfer to the newborn because the newborn has IgGs in their system when they're born against the COVID. And we only know that from third trimester vaccination of what it's doing for the neonate. So I would wait, if I were in my office, I would be recommending just around third trimester, but then you have to do a lot of timing with you get Rogam and you get DTaP and you know other vaccinations in your late second trimester, early third trimester that then you have to separate by uh, two weeks from the COVID vaccination, which again is two doses. So timing is gonna be one of the things they're gonna have to start looking at too. Sorry for the long explanation, but anyway, so. <laughs> Great. Well, Dr. Sauter, thank you so much for um, your presentation at the beginning of the talk today and for helping with the Q&A. Dr. Gold, as always, thank you so much for all of your research and presentation on the continuing, <laughs> the continuing saga of COVID-19. Um, wonderful to see all of you today, and we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, same time and same place. I hope everyone has a terrific week.